Bob, why don't we start with you and introduce yourself and why are you here? Uh, Bob Taylor, Harvey Sipian, to Hahnemann, 2002, seven and a half years out now. Okay. Uh, Jerry Cohen, uh, Huck, uh, June 2000, heart transplant. Dan Smith, heart transplant recipient. Uh, this Thanksgiving will be four years old. Chad Stevlin, heart double lung, Huck, 2003. Uh, Mike, Mike Petrelli, uh, my stepson Joe, passed away uh, in uh, 2007. Just interested in John's talk. Uh, John Brown, liver transplant recipient, March 11, 2005, the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. I'm the now daughter dad, 787. John's going to introduce himself when he gets up there. I'm Jim Gleason, heart recipient from 1994. Bob? Bob Kelsner, kidney transplant from my wife Susan in 92, and just recently in 08, my daughter Laura. Sue Kelsner, kidney donor for Bob. Rich Ford, heart recipient in Temple, March of 96. And with that, we introduce John Green, who I think everybody knows as the director of community relations here at Gift of Life Donor Program. Thank you, John, for coming back from your long trip and sharing the information you learned over there. Great. Uh, well, it's my pleasure uh, to, to be here and kind of talk to you a little bit about um, organ donation and transplantation around the world. So tonight we're going to take a really quick tour around the world just to <coughs> give you an idea of what's happening. Um, we were all very fortunate, uh, there were five of us, um, to go to um, <coughs> Berlin at the beginning of October and uh, this is our crew that we went uh, with. Uh, myself, Howard, who everyone knows, Sharon West, who is involved with our Transplant Information Center and also does a lot of the data needs for the organization, uh, John Abrams, who's the director of the Transplant Information Center, and Kathy Yandel, who is a supervisor with our hospital services. And uh, we were asked uh, to go to Berlin to do a series of presentations about Gift of Life and what it is that we do. And this Congress happens every two years. It's the ISODP, the International Society of Donation and Procurement. And Howard uh, has been the president of the organization for the last two years and just recently stepped down at the end of this Congress. And so Gift of Life had the most presentations um, at this Congress. And along the bottom, you see some pretty cool scenes of Berlin. It was my first time there, and it was really uh, a lot of fun. And uh, it was also Oktoberfest. So in the evening, we had, uh, we had a lot of good beer. So um, what was kind of interesting when they planned this was that the day before the Congress actually began uh, was World Organ Day. And so they had this huge celebration uh, down by the Brandenburg Gate, which is right here. And uh, they had this huge st stage, and they had all these celebrities and these singers come. And it actually was kicked off by Robert Redford, who sent a message uh, via the video. Uh, and we had thousands of people who came and helped celebrate. And it was very similar uh, to a lot of events we have here in terms of uh, you had the performers, and then you also had uh, the parkway with lots of various demonstrations and exhibits. All these different organizations across Europe were there to really highlight what they do to help uh, promote donation and transplantation. And I actually got to see a couple acts that I haven't heard from in a long time because they had the flyers and they're like, who are these people? Um, but we saw the German version of Britney Spears um, <laughs> called Janine. And, uh, the guy who sang the song Amadeus was one of the performers, and uh, the woman who sang 99 Red Balloons. Uh, and there was a really great celebration, and they had a lot of coverage uh, across uh, Berlin. Uh, and these are just some more examples. And what was great was this being right in front of this wall, because they were just gearing up for the 20th anniversary of the falling of the Berlin Wall. And uh, so everyone was in a very celebratory mood. And um, these are just some of the examples of the exhibits that were there. This is Sharon going through their version of the heart. Um, it's a mobile 
uh, educational display that they take all across uh, to educate people about the heart and how it works. Um, and then we also have lungs that you can step through. So it's kind of like a uh, like the Franklin Institute on uh, on their uh, parkway. <coughs> the other kind of cool thing that they did was these huge marionettes that were probably about three or four stories tall, and uh, they only bring them out for special occasions. So uh, to kind of kick off uh, World Organ Donor Day, they had them there and they went down the street. And then of course you had the the Ferris wheel and things like that. So it was quite a celebration. Now during the Congress, um, Howard gave two keynote addresses. One was to introduce um, everyone to this um, Congress, and then uh, he also did organ donation in times of financial constraints. And then in addition to those, we also did um, a couple other presentations. Um, but what was kind of interesting, it's always interesting when you see how they kick off these types of events. Because when it was in Philadelphia a couple years ago, we had several members of Team Philadelphia come in with the theme of Rocky. And uh, this time they had a, a children's choir of young pediatric transplant recipients singing. And uh, it was really uh, a great way to kick off uh, the celebration. Um, these were three of the oral presentations that we gave at the Congress. Uh, and I'll kind of, when I talk about the world, the state of the world and donation, I'll kind of touch on some of these things. Uh, but one was some, a presentation that I gave talking about driver's licenses and how registrating, uh, registrations on licenses can really uh, drive donor designations in a country. And then we also talked about improving tissue donor consent rates when a family is approached in an ER. And then also about the great success that our organization has had with um, donation after cardiac death. And then in addition to the oral presentations, we also did several. I have a question. Yeah. Do the other countries also use driver license registration for promoting organ donation? Some of them do. Oh. Um, but we'll see. Um, many of the countries, especially in the European um, community, use presumed consent. So it's a very different approach to donation. Um, we also had five personal presentations. And what was interesting about this Congress was that there was something for everyone. Um, so if you're involved with community education and public ed, um, there was this whole series of tracks for you. But a lot of it was clinical. Uh, and one of the things that I thought was fascinating was the largest country that was represented at this Congress. Uh, anyone want to guess what country that was? United States, Spain. Yeah. No, it wasn't Spain. China? No, it was in China. It was Russia. There were 77 people there uh, from Russia. And so they're really making a strong effort now to figure out how they can improve designation rates and donation rates. And so there's a whole track for a day in Russian about how they can actually do that. So many of these things were things that we do that people have come to us either across the country or in the, around the world to figure out how we do it. Our organ donation champion trainings uh, in which we educate nurses, um, that's a best practice that a lot of other OPOs in other countries are really looking at. So. And then just a couple pictures. Um, these are some of the, the movers and shakers of this, uh, this Congress. And, uh, but what I thought was really kind of interesting too were these bears. You know, a lot of cities have different um, mascots for their city. And in Berlin, it's the bear. And it's everywhere. So wherever you go across the city, you get to see how different uh, organizations and different businesses have dressed up their bear. So, it's a Berlin Bear. So while we have the Philly Fanatic here in Philadelphia, whenever they do public uh, programs, they trot out the Berlin Bear. So we saw him quite a few times over there. Um, this is the organizer of uh, the Congress, uh, Gunther, and um, he, um, he is there at the World Organ Donor Day, and just need you to click. And so this was one of the largest uh, international congresses that they had. We had 703 um, registrants. We had 92, uh, actually, from <coughs> Russia. 
And um, so he was the man of the hour, and he did a great job trying to um, organizing a very successful event. So, um, and he's looking for those big puppets that I mentioned earlier. But as we start talking about donation around the world, it was really fascinating for us um, from Gift of Life and from the United States because we are really blessed to, to have a great system. And um, these are some of the common elements that we find in organ donation systems around the world. For example, you know, you, here we have 58 OPOs in the United States who help coordinate donations. In many of the countries, um, they have a national coordinating body. Um, for example, in Spain, it's all done through um, a national organization. Um, one of the things that we had talked about was funding. How do uh, organizations and OPOs, how do they fund themselves? You know, is it something like we have, which is voluntary donations in Pennsylvania, or is it state uh, or national funding um, from the Department of Health? <coughs> we also spent a lot of time during this time talking about legislation and regulations, because so much of what we do is dependent on the laws. And so I'll talk a little bit about that when I illustrate some of the countries and the success or sometimes the challenges that they're facing. We also looked at how we how we look at how successful we are as organizations. You know, how do we measure? What kind of data can we get? And so it's fascinating um, to hear these reports from various countries on how they measure things and things that they wouldn't have thought of to measure that you know, we were able to show and uh, other presenters. Um, we also looked about how do you identify donors? You know, is it a first person consent model? Is it, um, is it an intent uh, for consent? Uh, also, there was a lot of discussion about presumed versus uh, the consent models that we have here. Um, also, living donation programs, there were a lot of presentations on that. Um, trying to figure out what are some of the more successful programs uh, across, the across the world, I should say. I'm so used to saying country, but this was uh, international. And then also, you know, professional education, public ed. So we'll talk about a few of those programs as we do. But the hot topic of the Congress was transplant tourism. Because, you know, we do not have this problem here in the United States because we all know that it's illegal to buy or sell organs. But in some of the other countries, whether it's China, whether it's Pakistan, it's a major problem. And you'll see with some of the figures that it has really impacted on their ability to provide donations and transplants to their populations. So these are just some of the, um, the countries that have been affected by this. So wherever Whatever presentation we went to, there was always some type of element about tourism. And it was, it was really fascinating to hear the challenges that these countries have been faced with. Now, a report that was issued by the World Health Organization identified five hot spots for organ transplant tourism. China, Pakistan, Pakistan the Philippines, Egypt, and Colombia. And what's been interesting about the Philippines is that Howard actually just came back from a week over at the Philippines. Um, because now they're looking to see how they can build a legitimate donation and transplant system. Um, and um, I'll talk a little bit about what some of the barriers have been with some of these countries and their experience with transplant tourism as we go along. But this was an article that appeared in Wired, Wired magazine. And it's something that we probably have seen uh, and been asked about when you go out and do public speaking in terms of you know, what actually are the costs of uh, various organs. And you can see, you know, depending <coughs> on the country that, you're, that you live in or the country that someone would go to to get an organ, you know, the costs are, you know, depend, you know, vary depending on how much money um, you would need to pay in that particular country. And, um, the strong theme from this Congress was, you know, we really have to stop. We have to put an end to transplant tourism. <clears throat> you know, what are some of the causes why people would do this, and how can we address this? And so, um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a few more slides. But, you know, 
one of the things that we're looking at is we're trying to figure out how big of a problem it is, because we all know it is, we've seen the media, is that there's not a lot of data that talks about um, how, how prevalent it is across the world. But you know, it was interesting to see in some countries it was only $10,000 US, in other countries it was close to $200,000 uh, in terms of getting a transplant. And um, it was just a really fascinating uh, conversation. And uh, so there had been a lot of improvements, a lot of legislation, acts that have been going on over the last several years to really combat that. And so Howard uh, is one of the, the leaders in this movement, and he actually was at the UN a couple weeks ago um, talking about transplant tourism and how to stop it. And so um, there was an important act that happened in Istanbul that countries came together and said, okay, we have to stop it, and we have to stop it now. But what I thought it would be kind of interesting to show you is how the U.S. ranks across the world with regards to deceased donation. And it should probably, for those of you who follow international transplants, it's probably no surprise that the leader is Spain. Yeah, and one of the reasons why Spain has been the leader for so many years is because they have presumed consent. And what presumed consent is, is that everyone is considered to be a donor unless you would opt out. So, you know, they have a very specific model that involves physicians in every hospital. And so you don't have to obtain consent from the family. It's just presumed that the family, that the donor, um, that a person is a donor unless they say John, I know that's the rule there, but everything we've heard is that they still ask the family, and the family rules in that situation. <coughs> and so I wonder how much was the education that they did for a decade in preparation for that versus they're not really following it in practice. Is that what you found out too, or am I misinformed? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, the only thing, what was interesting, what was frustrating in some ways about attending a conference like this was that you heard some of the information, but you didn't get all the knowledge about it. So I'm not exactly sure how, um, if that really is the case in which they need to ask each family. Um, you know, it's my assumption when I was there that, you know, it's just assumed that pe every donor is. There are some countries like Israel in which, you know, the family is asked. Uh, even though there is presumed consent, the family is still asked. And if the family says no, then they can't go. But I'm not sure if that's the case with yeah. Spain. Um, but what was interesting was the United States uh, globally were ranked fourth. <clears throat> and this really uh, shows an argument about first-person consent versus presumed consent. Because so many times people say that presumed consent is the way to go. And as an organization, we strongly believe that it should be first-person consent. And if you look at the numbers for us, um, we are as good, if not better, than Spain. And so we don't really believe that presumed consent is the only way to go. So this is just another way, and I'll be talking about some of these countries uh, a little bit later. But you'll see that you know, uh, England has 14.7. Uh, and what that is, is the number of deceased donors based on their population. Um, and you'll notice at the very end, Japan. And there's very specific reasons for that. And we'll talk about that one. Yeah. Now with living donation, what was interesting was when we were presented with these statistics that Cyprus is, a, is the world leader when it comes to living donation. Uh, followed by the Netherlands and Turkey. You know, the United States has also done a really great job, about 20.3 living donors per million. Um, and so, you know, as we were going through all the various presentations, you know, we heard from some of the leaders what it was that they were doing. Um, and so the goal overall is to bring all the countries up to the same level. So what's Cyprus doing? That they're double anybody else. <coughs> yeah. That's Was a, good a small question. number? Excuse me? Okay. Small number compared to the population? It's per so million. They can, it, well, it's, based, it's based per million, so everyone would be on the same uh, playing field. 
Uh, I'm not exactly sure because I didn't attend a presentation okay. um, with Cyprus that talked about that. John, the, the, when you say per million population, uh, when you have a country that has a lot of young people in mm -hmm. it and children, wouldn't that skew the, uh, the statistics? Well, um, these stats uh, are based on the population that would be eligible to be donors. Eligible, uh, yeah. per million eligible, mm -hmm. okay. okay. And then this is just another easier way to look at some of the numbers. And I always find it fascinating to see um, where we rank as a country compared to other countries around the world. So we'll talk about the United States first because that's the one that I'm most familiar with uh, in terms of uh, donation. And as you can see, as a country, we had almost 8,000 deceased donors in 2008. 848 DCDs and over 6,000 living donors. And um, one of the things that came out of the Congress was, you know, this fact that, you know, this belief that 46% of patients over the age of 60 currently would die before they receive a transplant. And it all talked about what we need to do on a global basis to really get people to say yes, to motivate them to say yes to donation. And so in the United States, there have been some several key factors that we've done. Um, as you know, for those of you who've been around here for a while, you know that we were faced with the challenge of how to increase designations and donations uh, in our region. And so we helped to pass Act 102 in 1994. And uh, it was one of the first times that a state government was really involved in trying to address the shortage. And so this is a model that we used here in the United States and that we're also um, showcasing around the world. You know, you need to get your governments involved. I think one of the interesting things, uh, one of the presentations at this Congress was um, about the European way of government. Because you have the individual European countries, but then you also have the European Council. And it's kind of like the United States of Europe. And what they're kind of struggling with right now is how do you adopt a system for all of Europe, still taking into account all the individual countries and their beliefs. Because in Europe, there are many countries like Spain who have presumed consent, and then there are other countries like Sweden that do not. And so they're really trying to grapple with what kind of response can they bring uh, to address the severe shortage of donors uh, throughout Europe. So we all know that people think donation is a good thing. But we also know that people don't always act even though they think it's a good thing. And so what are some of the ways that the United States has looked to to address this problem? And one of the things on a national level, and this is something that we really did a lot of presentations about over the last several years and also in Berlin, was that before we really did a national effort, you know, our donation rates were pretty good. They were like in the 500 level. But once we started doing national collaboratives, you know, how do you increase donors? How do you involve public education? How do you increase the number of transplants per donor? These were all different types of programs that were known as donation collaboratives, either the first, the second, or the transplant collaborative. You know, what are some of the best practices that hospitals who have a very successful consent rate and conversion rate, what do they do that we can roll out into all the hospitals within the country? So over the past five years, I would say, as these different collaboratives came about, you could see that the, the donation rate really increased, the number of donors. And um, so we wanted to showcase this and show that a national model of addressing donation can really make a difference in supplying uh, and giving transplants to people in the country. <clears throat> One of the other things that here in the United States we have done is the donor net. Now years ago, when we would have the national waiting list, and our transplant coordinators would go out into the field, they would have to individually call each person on a waiting list if they were eligible to receive a transplant. 
And now we've gone to an electronic system so that several people could be notified that there could be a potential order. And uh, it's all done electronically. Um, according to the waiting list, and we see that we have placed organs much in a more timely fashion using a, computer, a computerized system. And we know, looking at our healthcare system, that computerized records seems to be the way that we're all going. So as a donation system, we also need to take that into account. So um, this is something that all of the OPOs across the country have uh, incorporated. We also know about the success of our driver's licenses and the registries across the country. And these are just the three states that we serve, but we have, we have seen with the data that the more people who sign up and register to be donors, the higher the number of donors that we, had, that we coordinate with an OPL. And it's not just with Gift of Life, it's with donation programs across the country. So we do think that registries and providing an easy way for people to register is the way that a country can address the shortage of donors. And so a few slides ago I was talking about the collaborative. There's now a fourth collaborative called the Donor Designation Collaborative based on the success of many of these states. For example, in Utah or Oregon, we have states that have 75% of their licensed drivers have that donor designation and they have high um, donation rates. And so this is a model that we as a country are promoting across the world. Um, but you know, as I said, you know, the hot topic was transplant tourism. And you would think that in the United States we wouldn't have that problem, but um, earlier this year in New Jersey there was someone who was alleged to be part of uh, an organ trafficking system. So one of the things that we do uh, as a country and also as individual POs is when something like this comes up, we really need to reassure the, the public that the allocation system, that the waiting list, it's a fair and equitable system. You know, because we're dependent on people to say yes. And they need to believe that the system that we as a country have is a fair and equitable system. So we're waiting to see what happens with this, but we also reassure the public when something like this happens, that it is illegal, um, that this will not occur in the United States. Jeremy? Mm -hmm. uh, a while back on another chart, you showed uh, what the price was for different organs, and one was for lungs. Mm -hmm. are, are there people actually giving up their lungs along for money? Well, with living donation, you can uh, donate part of your lung. So, in some countries, that may be an option. Uh, I don't know of any specific countries that, that has occurred. But you're also talking about countries where it's not living donation, like China, where they actually pass, uh, prisoners, prisoners to get right. organs. Right. So, that might include some of those. And this is just um, another article that, that has appeared, um, and uh, we hear about this across the across the world, you know, whether it's Brazil, whether it's Pakistan, people for, um, for whatever reason donating or giving up one of their organs for, um, you know, to get paid. Also something else that, that we have been doing in terms of looking at living donation, because we really believe living donation is a way uh, to go, is paired donor exchanges. And Gift of Life recently has instituted a living donor program, and we actually helped with a, um, a series of chains, and I think there were 11 different parts of that chain. And what uh, living donor exchanges is, if, if I would have a wife that um, would want to donate a kidney to me, but I'm not, she's not a match for me, she would go on a list, and she could be a match for someone else. And that person, their, their living donor may not be a match for them, and it would be just a lot of different people who want to have a recipient and a donor. They may not be matches, but they could be matches for each other. So it's all based on a mathematical model, and so they connect all the links to this chain. So before, it really wasn't an option, now it is. And so um, we're participating in this, and this is just another example of how we can increase living donation. Is that unique to the United States? 
Um, it's not, I don't think it's unique. I think we're at the forefront of really promoting it as a way of addressing the shortage. And you'll be hearing more about this living donor exchange. Um, I know CBS News is planning to do um, a television program earlier in next year about that. Um, and then also it's the media, you know, and how do you develop strong media partners and showcasing what it is that we do. And um, so we've been doing a lot of that. This was an article that appeared a couple uh, years ago. And there was a whole presentation on how do you address media with negative stories, with positive stories, to really promote donation. So let's talk about Australia. Because one of the interesting things that I thought when I heard about this was that for the country of Australia, they only had 259 deceased donors last year for the entire country. And as an OPO, we have reached over 400. So what are some of the challenges that they're facing uh, as a country? And so one of the things is that, and this is a common element with many, many countries, is that there's a lot of myths and misconceptions. You know, and it's something that they want to do, but they need to develop registries, they need to develop public education. And so that's what a lot of the sharing of the ideas was or over there. Um, they experienced a 30% increase uh, from 198 to 259 in a year. And um, you know, we've talked with them about how they can increase designations. Um, you know, they're looking at, the, at a registry, um, and so they're trying to figure out how to do it on a more national level. You know, they, have a, uh, they do have um, a way that you can register, but it's not really connected to a national organization. So it's kind of, all the pieces don't come together. And so that's one of the things that we've been talking to them about and uh, figuring it out. But one of the things that they did do was um, soccer. Uh, getting involved with sports because Australians are very fit and they're always about, you know, always doing sports. So um, they're doing a campaign um, with a local sports team and um, so that's one of the ways that they're trying uh, to promote donation. So I thought that was kind of an interesting perspective, something that we've done. Uh, Canada, our neighbor to the north, um, last year they had 492 deceased donors for the entire country. Um, we've also worked very closely with them, um, trying to figure out how we can um, how we can work together. Uh, one of the things that we've done is we testified in front of uh, the parliament uh, because they have a national health system and that causes some problems. Uh, so they're looking at instituting a registry, which they just started, and. Um, but these are some of the, the national debates that are going on within Canada because, like with many countries, you know, you have the national system, but then you have to also take into account, you know, their local provinces, you know, and um, you know, you have the Quebec that's very French, you know, you have a difference between the East and the West, and so these are all kinds of things and also cultural, you know, in the city of Toronto, for example, we're truly in this space. There are so many different cultural groups, uh, and you have to get a message out to all of them. And um, one of the things that they also just instituted not too long ago was a policy on donation after cardiac death. It was something that they hadn't um, developed before. So based on our model, they, uh, they've instituted that, and so that is just another way now that they're instituting a, um, you know, addressing that need for more donors. Um, and then one of the other things that they have done was the Recycle Me campaign. Because they're kind of at the bottom in terms of increasing awareness, one of the populations that they wanted to target was young kids. And so they developed this campaign that's really cutting edge about using the body and talking about recycling, because young people have grown up with that whole concept. And so they wanted to use that and promote donation. So when you go onto their website um, with Trillium, you know, you have a game that you can play, 
Uh, it's very interactive. You know, you can text people, you can Facebook, you can Twitter. Um, and so what they've seen is that the number of people who register in Canada, especially younger people, has increased dramatically because they've had this cutting edge campaign. It also has had a lot of impact in terms of their media. And it hasn't been that popular with people who are older because they kind of think it's, um, it's disrespectful. But for younger people, you know, it's been a big hit with that. So let's talk about China for a minute. Because this uh, was a topic that came up uh, quite a bit over there. Uh, and as you know, China has had a lot of issues uh, with regards to donation. Um, you know, um, there's been a lot of uh, concern because for many years, a lot of their transplants, a lot of their donors were home prisoners. And it took a long time for people outside of China to convince them that it, that is not the way to go. And so, um, <coughs> When we were in Berlin, and also when we were here in Philadelphia a couple of years ago, you know, there were demonstrations that were really highlighting um, the policies of the Chinese government when it came to, to donation. Something, something about that, if I may add, we think of prisoners, we're talking here political prisoners who uh -huh. may be you know, in prison for some being against the government, and all of a sudden you've got very healthy people in prison who are suspect of being killed for donation. So it's a big issue. Right. But you know, I think China is a great example of a country that is faced with a dilemma. For so many years, they had a system that was broken. They had a system that fed on um, unethical practices that the general population really had no trust in organ donation. They thought it was shady. They thought there were things illegal about it. So when people really want to build a donation uh, system that is ethical, that works, that's the first issue that they have to do is overcome all of that negative belief within a country. These are just some of the, um, the other examples of talking about transplant tourism in China. You know, for many years the government said it didn't exist when everyone else knew it did. So it's keeping governments accountable for the actions that they take when it comes to donation and transplantation. Singapore was also another example uh, talking about transplant tourism. You know, they say that there's a law that forbids it, but yet there's this belief in society that it does occur. And so one of the things that um, many of us talked about over there was how do you make the law a reality? For example, in China, you know, what they've done now with the Ministry of Health is instituted a new educational program. You know, they're looking at ways to register donors legitimately and also guidelines for allocation. So it's not going to be who you know that will help get you that kidney um, earlier. And so um, it's all about trying to be transparent. And uh, it's going to take a lot of time um, to bring that system around. So let's talk about France. As you can see, last year they had 1,600 um, deceased donors. And over the years, the number of donors in France has changed. So as they were talking and they looked at models of other countries, they, they took the Spanish model. And so what they did was they adopted an opt-out system. And um, you know, whenever you got a bunch of Europeans in the same room, you know, and allocation and how do you increase estimations. There was always this ongoing debate about the Spanish model versus other models. And, um, and so for France, they, they decided to create an opt-out registry. So um, every country is a little different, um, but I think a lot of it depends on getting public education uh, so that people know how they can register and what, how they can make that donation decision. So in India, it's been an interesting challenge with them because some of it is government and legislation, but a lot of it is cultural and religious. So with Hindus, um, they really believe that if you remove your organs, that if you're reincarnated, you'll come back and you'll be missing those organs. And so how do you really address beliefs like that? 
And so we had heard a couple presentations, you know, which just starts on a very local level, um, and getting those religious leaders, you know, really talking to them and getting them on your side, and then using them as advocates um, to promote donation even more. So I thought it was also kind of interesting, you know, 288 people die every day in auto accidents. Um, there's so many people in India who are waiting for a transplant, and so they're looking and they say, you know, it could be a steady supply of organs. And I think that was one of the interesting things about going to this uh, meeting, because you have people from all over the world. And English was the language that most of these presentations were in. And um, it was just fascinating to hear how they describe their countries, because what we take for granted here in the United States, of beliefs and processes, you know, many of the countries are still trying to figure out. Um, you know, Singapore, yeah, it's another example, cash for organs. Um, people are talking about how do you address that, that shortage, and so there's all these different plans uh, to come and do that. Um, and so, you know, Howard and um, Dr. Delmonico and other people who are really monitoring um, this transplant tourism, they're really looking at each of the countries to figure out and to promote um, the ban of tourism. And so when these things come up, you know, you have to look to see, is this the right way? And, you know, even though some leaders in these countries may feel of this, you know, we, we tell them, uh, we show them why we believe that it's not, you know, and to help to spark that discussion. In Israel, 72 uh, deceased donors in 2008 and 58 living donors. And once again, um, in Israel, a lot of it has to do with religious beliefs. Because, you know, we face it when we go out and we speak, um, that people think that the Jewish faith doesn't support donation. And so, um, at one point also, there were a lot of people who were going to Israel um, to get transplants. So, one of the things that they did was, you know, they got the highest body um, to really look at donation to, and to come out with a strong statement uh, and then it's a matter of getting that information out to the general public. You know, one of the other interesting things that uh, we saw over in Berlin was that there is a, a new documentary that will be coming out. And it's about a Palestinian boy who was killed by an Israeli soldier um, and they donated his uh, organs to several people in Israel. And it was the journey of this father of this Palestinian boy who went back over to Israel um, to meet the recipients of his son's organs. And, uh, and it really was interesting because it showed um, the beliefs of many of the Israelis. And uh, so they've got a lot of work that they still need to do. Uh, Turkey, once again, they have a very low um, designation. They only had 242. And this is where we did the Declaration of Istanbul. And this was bringing countries, representatives from countries all over the world, to really take a strong stance on transplant tourism and organ trafficking. And so there was a declaration that was passed that, um, that stated that the success of transplantation as a life-saving treatment does not require, nor does it justify, victimizing the world's poor. And that's something that you'll see in a lot of countries, like Pakistan um, and India. And so they discussed ways to build plans, and they called for countries to implement the plans. And we've seen over the last two to three years that this declaration has had a direct impact on how countries are now um, implementing donation programs across, uh, across the world. Um, and yeah, this is just some examples of some of the articles uh, that came out because there's this very big news. This is the first time there was an international body who got together and said, you know, tourism, transplant tourism has got to stop. Um, just another example of an article. Pakistan is one of the countries in which a lot of people went to um, to get uh, transplants um, from all over the world. So what happened was, um, you know, they implemented legislation. And they said, you know, that 
um, that foreigners aren't eligible to get transplants in Pakistan, that it needs to be um, people who live in Pakistan. Um, one of the other things that um, they had to deal with was the Muslim faith, and really talking about um, that their religion does support um, organ donation. And so what many of the representatives of donation programs were doing, starting very small and building up. But the problem that Pakistan has is that for so many years, people donated um, organs um, to foreigners. And so now to try and combat that, to say that's no longer what we do, and to build a legitimate transplant program, um, they're having to deal with, um, with addressing all of those concerns. Uh, it's really hard to build a program, but um, slowly but surely, they're doing it, and they adopted a, um, an ordinance, and so they've seen some really good results um, for that. Yeah, there's still a lot of discussion, and there's still people who think that that might be an option, um, and so you know, we just monitor it. We have people who go over, and um, Dr. Delmonico travels around the world, because this is his cause to stop transplant tourism around the world. So what happened before they passed the law, there were 2,000 transplants that were carried out in Pakistan. 1,500 of them were foreigners. But since that law was passed, 800 transplants were performed. 96 of them were related donations within Pakistan. Now the Philippines, it's fascinating because for a country of 69 million people, they only had three transplant coordinators. Um, for the entire country. And how do you build a system, an effective system, uh, when you don't have that many coordinators to, uh, to address the situation? So uh, about two months ago, uh, we had a couple of representatives um, from the Philippines come over here for about a week, a week and a half, to observe what it is that Gift of Life does. Uh, then last week, Howard went over there. And it's really looking at what the structure is needed to build a donation system for, for a country. And um, part of it inc includes, you know, passing legislation, um, you know, getting hospitals on board, training the doctors, making sure that people know how they can be a donor and why it's important for people to say yes to their nation, addressing those cultural and religious beliefs. Um, but the other thing, too, is to take a strong stance against organ trafficking. <coughs> And that's what the government has done. So now that it's no longer an option for people to come to the Philippines, um, how, do you, how do you help your own people to get those transplants? And so um, they passed an order. Um, they involved uh, professional societies. And so now they're beginning to plant the seeds. And I'm sure over the next several years that they're, they're going to build a successful program. It'll be small when it starts, but um, you know, at least there's hope uh, in the Philippines. In Saudi Arabia, it's been interesting. There were a couple presentations about Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, you know, part of it is involving the government. You know, there's a lot of competition among Arab countries in terms of who's the best, who's got the highest building. And it was interesting when you heard from the Saudis, you know, they were talking about leading um, the Arab world in terms of the number of transplants. And, um, you know, once again, it's talking about those religious beliefs and addressing them and making sure that people understand that it is a good thing um, and a positive thing for them to do. And um, what was interesting, one of the facts was that they didn't even have their first living transplant in 1979. Saudi Arabia. So they've made some great strides, but um, they still have a lot more work that they need to do. In Spain, yeah, this many times is seen as the world leader with donation. Last year they had 15, 1,600 um, deceased donate, don, uh, donations for their, um, for their program. And so there was a lot of talk about how did they do what they do. Um, and all of it is built on presumed consent. And so it's one way that, that you can have a very successful um, donation program on a national level. And um, you know, so many countries are now going to Spain to see if they can copy that success. 
and um, so Spain was all over the place. And uh, you know, but one of the things is that they have a very strong system in place in terms of education, in terms of their physicians. Um, so everyone knows what needs to be done. And you know, since they implemented presumed consent, the number of uh, donors has increased very significantly. But now they've kind of plateaued. Where do they go to now? John? Yep. The, uh, you know the statistic we have in our country that 18 people a day die mm -hmm. awaiting a transplant? In a country like Spain, what would this statistic be for them? I see over there, Britain, it's one per day. In the second article on the right-hand side, the end of the first paragraph. Right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm... And in the United Kingdom, there's been a lot of discussion. You know, for a country their size, they have a very small uh, percentage of people who are deceased donors. And so as they're looking to see how to build up their system, one of the things that they're talking about is presumed consent. You know, they're reviewing donations. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, residents who aren't um, from one country, can you go there to get a transplant? And so, you know, looking at legislation, looking at what they need to do. They also have a donor card that they, uh, they ask people to sign out to sign up for, and they also have some really innovative campaigns, and that's one of the, several of the ways that they're addressing um, donation. Um, just some more examples, you know, you know, the Prime Minister, for example, is, is talking about that presumed consent opt-out uh, system. So, so what can I say? A lot of discussion about that. Um, Japan is an interesting country. Only 13 deceased donors um, for the year 2008. And over the nine years that I've been here, we've had several um, media crews, several professionals come, come here to see what it is that we do um, because they are faced with some significant challenges in Japan. And one of the primary things that they're faced with is Buddhism and the belief that, uh, that Buddhists have. The other thing is that they don't allow, and they, for a long time they didn't allow children to receive organ transplants. So if you had a child who needed a transplant, many times you would need to come to the United States or another country. But recently they passed a law that said, now children can. But it is a belief system, a religious system, a, a religious, um, belief that uh, so many people in Japan have, they don't, there's been a lot of discussion about brain death, they don't quite understand the concept of brain death, and so many times when TV crews would come here, it would be all about educating, trying to educate the Japanese what brain death means, that when there is no function of the brain, that that person is considered dead. <coughs> And there's a lot of education that also needs to be uh, in the hospitals also. But Buddhists also believe that when you die, you, you know, to go to the next place, you need to have everything within your body. And so that's been a major hindrance in Japan in terms of uh, promoting donation. It's interesting, too, um, the Stenzel twins who are out of California just recently did a tour in Japan to raise awareness. They were over there for a month. These are two young girls who uh, were born with cystic fibrosis. Both are alive today because of lung transplants. And they have a book, uh, The Power of Two, which has been translated into Japan. So as part of a book tour, they went over and did 20 presentations in a month to help raise awareness all through Japan of the cause. Mm -hmm. So the United States helping, as John is talking about, in many different ways. <coughs> And just, you know, another thing that I uh, learned over there was in terms of Egypt, you know, that they have a very uh, a, a situation in term with transplantation and tr tourism. So, you know, it's looking at those countries and really trying to address that. So. Um, and so, you know, 
China, Egypt, Colombia, they, you know, these countries who for many, many years were havens for people to go and get um, transplants from other countries are now taking a very strong stand. So that declaration that happened in Istanbul, Istanbul is really <coughs> having an effect worldwide in terms of uh, transplant tourism. So what are some of the best practices in terms of initiatives when it comes to um, promoting donation? And these are just some of the, the things that uh, we summarized. You know, continuing to develop programs, conferences to really share best practices to increase the number of deceased organ donors. You know, you have to involve national governments to address this because you need to have the proper legislation to have registries to promote public education, to have the funding that you need for successful programs. And you have to bar to ban transplant tourism. Because what happens in one country spills over into so many other countries and so many people. You know, it's a global, it's a mobile global world that we live in. People go from one country to another. So it's really taking that hard stand when it comes to transplant tourism. So that's the end of my presentation. Yeah. Good question, guys. You talked about medical tourism. And this is a neighbor gave me an article in the November issue of here. Uh, College of uh, New Jersey magazine, where a professor was talking about in the United States and Great Britain, they're studying possibly a pilot program for incentivizing people to donate their kidneys. Are you aware of anything like that? Well, there's been a lot of discussion um, in terms of what kind of benefits or incentives you can give to living donors. You know, whether it's um, a tax break, whether it's um, you know, giving uh, your wages while you're recovering. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion. Um, nothing's happened in Pennsylvania. Um, and, you know, and we walk a very fine line because you don't want to incentivize donation. Um, but, you know, because living donation is something that we feel can grow, what, what can we do to help? Yeah. yeah. So I think there will be some pilot programs and I don't know what the amounts would be. Um, but it's a reference to the health insurance. Mm -hmm. Health insurance, yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, because there aren't a lot of costs in health when it comes to living donors. Now, and also, also education credits mm -hmm. for the family members to okay. Now, in Pennsylvania, we do have uh, a $300 benefit that's available to, um, to families. And uh, we find that most of them are living donors, and it's only $300 and it would pay for either lodging or for food. Um, and this was part of the original Act 102 that was um, passed in 1994. So we haven't seen a great deal of people use it um, because, and we felt 300 was a yeah, good Yeah, for $300, that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> you're not gonna donate for $300. Mm -hmm. And people don't get that benefit um, directly. They would go to either the hotel or the restaurant. But one of the things I also wanted to share was I did attend a presentation by the Catholic Church about donations. That's one of the questions that always comes up. And so they had someone, a father, come from the Vatican to talk about it. And it was kind of difficult to understand him because he had a very heavy Italian accent speaking English. Um, but um, some of the comments that he made that I wrote down that I thought might be interesting you know, is the official belief of the Catholic Church, you know, that organ donation and transplant is a good thing, um, and that the Catholic Church views donation as restoration of the joy of life, that donation is the altruistic giving of oneself, and that he also then got into transplant tourism. And he, uh, he mentioned that the body cannot be considered to be a mere object that we are the stewards of our own bodies, and that um, the Catholic Church does not support altruistic donation to someone that you don't know, but they do support it to someone that you do know, which is something interesting that I've never heard that before. <laughs> um, they have taken a strong stance against trafficking and commercialization, because it's all about um, you know, with Pakistan and so many of those countries, 
you know, as poor people and victimizing those poor individuals. And so um, they certainly have taken a strong stance against that. Um, they also see that the sole solution um, is to increase the number of potential organ donors. And that organ donation is a great example of being a good Samaritan. And in Israel, one of the things that I noted too was that religion plays a much more important factor in terms of promoting and educating people than what an individual's education level is. Religion is the number one reason why people say yes or many times say no to a donation. John, just to add to that, because you made reference to it, uh, the rabbinical whatever was up there. Just recently we had a speaker come in and speak at a synagogue over Mount Holly. And I've always heard the mitzvah, it's a nice thing, it overrules the law mm -hmm. so that a Jewish person can donate and it's not uh, against the law. But the rabbi during his service said it in a way I've never heard before, that's why I'd like to share it. He held this up and read piece of it. He said, what this says is you have an obligation to save a life if you can. Mm -hmm. It's not only above the law, but if you don't, you are in sin. Mm -hmm. And I was blown away by how forcefully he said that, because I've never heard it said that forcefully before. Mm -hmm. And I always thought sin was something that was in the Catholic thing. <laughs> right. And here is sin in the Jewish faith, was very different for it. But he said it stronger than I've ever heard it before, and I haven't recorded, so I know what he said. But uh, it adds to exactly what you're saying. Were you in a reformed synagogue? I don't know the difference, to be honest okay. about it, Jerry. Can you say it then? I would never say the words. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, that yeah. distinguishes <laughs> what that was, I guess. <clears throat> we heard it, didn't we? <laughs> yes. Is there any figures on whether the, the females don't even more over the male? Well, we know that that's the case in the United States. And it seemed to be, with some of the data presentations that I saw, that women uh, donate more than men. But, you know, it's interesting because, you know, with a lot of the presentations, they didn't have the data that we do, that we track over here. Let me interrupt just for one second. Those who came in late, why don't you introduce yourself? Why don't you start? Uh, Alfonso Brown, senior. Uh, I'm a brand new member. I was going to start two years ago after my second heart transplant. And I got had two heart transplants and one kidney transplant. So I had, honestly, I tell you, when I was here last night, and I was in the parking lot, and you know, as I am long overdue to be a volunteer. I mean, the gift of life does so, so much for me. And within the last three weeks, I've learned so much more stuff. I even broke my church um, Sunday, and I had Daryl um, Nancy. Thing. Also, but I mean, I am just thrilled just to be a volunteer. I even went out this morning with both all these in my book, and I was handing out stuff to people. I spoke to one lady this morning. You know, I just—I mean, I just felt energized. You know, and last night I heard facts about African Americans how we don't don't. You know, I think she told me. 18 people in August or 17 in, I mean, just low numbers, just right. critically low numbers. And I'm going to do whatever I can to try sure. to help. Sorry, pretty much. Jack, moving over to you. Well, my name's Jack Morris, and I'm the uh, first time here. So I had my heart transplant in uh, uh, November 24th, 2007. The two years old come out the <laughs> all right. Great. And, uh, I'm doing all right. And uh, you drag Bob along. Bob, we're just introducing ourselves. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's a friend that just came along, right? You haven't had a transplant yet. No, yeah. not. Oh, he has. I'm sorry. Uh, Go ahead. Give him your story. <laughs> My name's Bob Lewis. I had a transplant about three years. Kidney transplant about three years ago. Okay. And according to the doctor, everything's going fine. Great. So far. Good. Coming down the road, Rich. Well, you were here. You were here to introduce yourself. Go ahead. Um, Diana Clark. I am a donor family. My grandson died in April. 
Steve? I'm Steve White. Uh, I had a heart transplant one year ago, November 4th. And so that's the whole crew. Back to questions. Uh, off the out. Mm -hmm. Why don't you think it's a good thing with regards to, let's say, we'll start with Pennsylvania, forget about the others. Um, personally, I, I think it's the decision that that's up to the individual to make. You know, and I do think, you know, based on what, what we do, um, we would much rather have it be a choice that people would say yes to as opposed to, there are many people who feel that an opt-out system, um, it's the government taking control somewhat of your body. But you can opt out. I mean, it's not, if you if you couldn't opt out, I could understand that. Mm -hmm. But you can only say no. Right. But you know, it's been interesting because, you know, last year in Delaware, they introduced that. And there was so much public outcry about it because, you know, it's all based on public trust, and you know, I do think people should have an informed, should be able to make an informed decision. And um, yeah, I, I just don't think presumed consent is personally. I feel it's the way to go. Do you do you feel it should be? I think if you, if you have a country like Spain, you have a country like uh, France, mm -hmm. I mean, to me. Um, <coughs> They may be more homogeneous, mm -hmm. and that might be one reason, mm -hmm. but I think you'll get many more uh, heart um, donors, uh, not heart, you'll get many more donors by the opt-out system. Well, I think the key is, um, is education and just getting more people to sign up. Yeah, there's always going to be people who say no, um, but I do think, um, yeah, I do think it should be a choice that people make. <clears throat> so. Again, one of the success things that goes in those countries, they look at presumed consent made the difference. They did not just pass a law. They spent a decade educating the public as to why this was so important. It would be interesting to see a country that did the education and didn't do presumed consent, whether they would get the results we're seeing with presumed consent. But just take it into account. It's not just a law. It's that public education which is so powerful. And we're doing in this country in so many different ways, but not like they did there. I mean, that was preparation for the public to accept that law. And even some countries that have presumed consent, you, can, um, you know, you still need to get the, you know, you still need the family to say yes. So, um, you know, it's a system that I think works really well. Um, we can improve it in terms of the system that we have here. So I'm getting, getting back to the Congress itself. How much time is spent going over <clears throat> the suggestions from the last Congress? In other words, the last time is in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So what proposals there? I mean, when you were initially started, mm -hmm. is, is it, are those brought up as what has happened from proposals from the last Congress? Well, you know what? What happens is that there's a lot of presentations and a lot of networking that goes on and follow up. And you know, each you know, like the U.S. has their own conferences. European countries have their own. Um, there is always the two that I've been to. There's always been like the state of the world and where we've come. Um, and what are some of the hot topics? You know, transplant tourism. You know, that took a lot of uh, time at this Congress because there's been a lot of progress. Um, you know, there aren't any real initiatives that come out of this um, at the end of the day, but um, it's more just giving promote uh, presentations of what's worked so that people who go can take it, network, and follow up with that. Yeah. Just a side note, if you've been following Three Rivers on Sunday night, first of all, the show is going to have a different time slot this Sunday. It'll be at 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock on CBS. The story does involve a uh, well-to-do family finds out they can't buy an organ here in this country, and they go na they go abroad, mm -hmm. and so that would be the topic uh, that you're going to see Sunday's Three Rivers focusing on, which relates a little bit to what John's talking about. I don't know if it's organ trafficking or just tourism, but uh, watch it, and uh, 
John, I don't know if you'd be interested in doing this, but there is, out of Donate Life Hollywood, an analysis each week of what's coming up in the show. Mm -hmm. And they often have an expert talking to the issues that are raised in that show. Mm -hmm. And it's something that could be passed around by email. Would that be something that uh, you know, <coughs> think we'd use faith distribution list to put out to everybody just so they know? Or would you like to pass it through yourself and then you can see what yeah, you think? Yeah, and, and we, we can do that. That's not a problem. Okay. Because each week what they do is they, they do find an expert to talk about whatever the main issue was. And a couple of weeks ago it was Dr. Eisen from uh, Hahnemann who was the expert on why one particular heart waiting patient got a transplant over another. And the other thing that's been very interesting about that show is a lot of people say, oh, yeah, but it's not real. You know, they're, they're so misrepresenting things. But I think I've found that in most cases, it's most people's experience aren't broad enough to realize those things do happen. And some of the most extreme things, they're rare, but they do happen. So last week, I think it was, was the guy, uh, ALS uh, victim, who took himself off the ventilator to donate, all right? And uh, it turned yeah. out it's based yeah. on a real story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, it didn't happen in the car like evidently did in the episode, but <clears throat> there, there is a story of a patient who really did uh, withdraw from support to be able to be an organ donor. So some of those things are real, yet some of them are entertainment, and these little uh, insights by an expert give you some something to speak of if you're out there talking like you're talking about. Uh, and somebody raised the question, you have some more background to say, well, yeah, that's true, but, you know. They also have the, the first official false alarm on the show, too. They've alluded to somebody having a false alarm. They actually showed a recipient or a potential recipient getting ready to have a surgery, and they said, you have a fever, you know, that can be an infection, we can't go forward from here, and showed, like, the emotional reaction that he had. This is not a happy thing, but I understand, and they kind of wrestled with that, but at least they showed that it's not, hey, in a half an hour or an hour, you get a heart, you get a kidney, you get a liver. They showed that it was really at the time frame. And this guy's been on it from day one, and I think they're like episode seven or eight now. Yeah, something like that. It looks like they're going to order a couple more episodes, so it isn't being canceled yet. <laughs> and what they're trying to do is see if they can find a better spot for it instead yeah. of always up against the football games and right. Desperate Housewives, I guess. <laughs> so it's going to be interesting to see if it makes a difference. But, but the other part of your, uh, to answer your question, Bob, is that you know they, um, they call for abstracts. And what they're really looking for are best practices. Mm -hmm. So the only things that are really accepted are those that have had proven results. Oh, I remember that from the Right. Um, and one of the interesting things that's now uh, going to be happening next year is that there's going to be a global summit of, uh, of leaders of donation programs. And part of that is coming out of the, the discussions that have happened at uh, Congresses like this. And so it's really going to be looking at, okay, how can we really increase donation and transplant in Germany or in the Philippines? And so they're bringing a lot of countries together, probably out in California, to really develop that, those leadership skills that so many countries are lacking in terms of donation, because they, don't ha they haven't had the experience that we've had here in the States. And, um, and so that's hopefully in the next year, you know, when they have the Congress again, you know, we'll have some initial results of what's happening. So. You know, one of, one of the things I'd like to know is in these countries where they have presumed consent, is there less of a need for living donors? Do they have less waiting lists than we, you know the countries that they It would really be interesting to know how you know how the those statistics work out. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but Howard would know. Because he knows everything. Um, but you know, why don't I try to I'll, I'll try to get a response for you for the next meeting. Can you use hearts and lungs from cardiac death? Excuse me? Can you use hearts and lungs from cardiac death? Again, well, very rarely. Yeah. They have. It's very yeah. rare. Yeah. They have. Yeah, At least, right. you know, one or two, but it's never it's not the practice. Is that something yeah, it's not common. I mean, it's, 